leading us in worship. Thank you for that new song with beautiful words. And uh, thank you guys for trying to clap. Um, <laughs> sounded good. Well, some of you are struggling to clap and sing at the same time, which, don't worry, I get it. I'm a, I'm a drummer. Um, and, you know, open mouth, open hands. We don't know the coordination between those things. It's fine. We'll learn. The more we do it, the more we'll learn. Yeah, well, guys, welcome to the first Sunday of 2024. Uh, I hope you all had a good rest. Um, Robs and I and Jamie had an opportunity to visit family both in Joburg and Cape Town, which was a real sweet time for us. And uh, we're looking forward to spending another year as the Lord wills um, in ministry with you all. And uh, it's a delight to be here and to share God's word with you on the first Sunday of the year. Uh, a friend of mine posted on Facebook just after, I think, New Year's Day, that 2014 was 10 years ago. 2014 was 10 years ago. It's amazing, right? Uh, I replied, I responded on his post saying his education had not failed him. Uh, he, he was, in fact, able to minus 10 from 24 and get to 14, um, which is impressive. Uh, yes, he is still my friend. And yes, sarcasm and snark are two of my spiritual gifts. You'll get to know that the more you get to know me. But something strange, something strange and mystical happens in the mind of every westernized human being on the 1st of January every year. We know what that is. We start hoping and praying that the start of a new calendar year will bring us a bigger dose of joy and fulfillment than the calendar year that ended when the clock struck 12 on the 31st of December. We, we play this game every single year. See, the new year brings with it hope. Hope that this year will have more joy and less sorrow, more triumph and less tragedy, more fortune and less affliction. It also brings hope not just for a change in circumstances or fortune, but also hope for personal improvement too. Uh, somehow, because it is now 2024 instead of 2023, I will magically become a new and improved version of myself. A new human being with an inherent discipline and drive to say no to the things I consistently, consistently said yes to, and to say yes to the things I consistently said no to. Despite the fact that I failed to do this last year and the year before that, this year will be different. It will be, right? Don't laugh. We're serious. Don't laugh. We're serious. Well, this year will be different starting tomorrow. <laughs> or as soon as I find the time and energy to sort out my schedule, right? So why do we do this? Why do we do this? Why do we do this as human beings? Why are gyms busier in January and February? Why does church attendance spike in January and February and then taper off throughout the rest of the year? Ultimately, it's because we're creatures of hope. That's why. We are creatures of hope. Remember the story series we did last year? Anybody remember that? It's four sermon series. Well, we're still in the story. Somebody came up to me after the last sermon in that series and said, so the story's over. And I'm like, no, you weren't listening to the sermon series. The story's not over. The story was revealed. We're always living in it. And one of the things that we learned in that sermon series is that we all live in the hope of a better world. We all live in the hope of a better world. We dream of a better life. We live our life in view of our hopes and desires. And so we look to something new in the hope that new will be better. A second shot at paradise. A second shot at a better life. Something better than last year. Whether that's a new car, a new job, a new house, a new phone, a new body, a new diet, a new identity, a new relationship, a new Bible reading plan, a new adventure, a new project, a new habits, or new year. We look to new things to give us hope. But the truth is eventually that newness wears off. And as the newness wears off and fades away, it go, with it goes the hope of our better world. That hope is crushed. Because the things we chase after have no real power to change us or to satisfy us. And just like that, we're stuck in the day-to-day -day grind of life, waiting for the 31st of December, 2025. So we can start the illusion 
all over again. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is the most encouraging New Year's sermon I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I am going to share this with all my friends, especially the ones I don't like. But seriously, being hopeful is a good thing. Being hopeful is a good thing. We're creatures of hope. There's nothing wrong with being hopeful. Longing for change is natural for people living in a broken world, and seeking to improve yourself is a noble task. There's nothing wrong with desiring those things, and often a new beginning, like the start of a new year, is a catalyst for change, can serve as a catalyst for change. But what we really need is to live our lives in view of something that will empower us to become the type of person that God created us to be, so that we can long for the paradise of his kingdom and in doing so become a blessing to this world and the people around us because we are living in light of a true hope and a newness that will never fade. And so what is this view that we should live out of? Well, that's what we're going to look at over the next two Sundays. It's a little mini-sermon series called Life with a View. We're going to be in Romans 12. And for today, we're just going to look at verse 1. We're just looking at Romans 12, verse 1. And so I'm going to read that for us now, and then we're going to pray, and we'll get stuck in. Romans 12, verse 1. If you've got a Bible, you can follow, or you can read it on the screen, I think. There it is. I'm reading from the ESV version. Paul writes, and he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. And just so you know, that word in the original, brothers, means, can mean brothers and sisters. So this is not just to the guys, it's to everybody. I appeal to you, church, basically. By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Let's pray. Father, we gather together on this first Lord's Day of the year 2024. That means that it's been 2,024 years, Lord, since you were on the earth. 2,024 years of sustaining grace, of your power being present in the gospel, of changing lives, and we stand here today as evidence of that grace. And so, Lord, we want to come as your people, and we want to live rightly in the world. We want to have a correct view of our lives so that we can live for your glory, so we can be a blessing to others. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, give us the right lens to look at our lives, at the world, and at one another through. Lord, we just sang a song, only there, only there, Love and mercy flow to me only at the cross. And so, Lord, we pray that in the next few minutes, Jesus would be made much of. Lord, the cross would be central in our lives. And as a result, Lord, we would be changed individuals ready to live our day-to-day lives for the glory of your name. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. So if you're taking notes, the first point, there's only two points. first point is a merciful view. So, what is the view that we should live out of? What is it that will energize us, empower us, and inspire us to live as a new type of humanity, displaying God's kingdom in our world? Well, according to this verse, it's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God. The NIV and the CSB translations both translate the phrase, by the mercies of God. So I read from the ESV version, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. The NIV and the CSB both translate that phrase as, in view of God's mercy, or in view of the mercies of God, which is where the sermon title comes from. So Paul is basically making an appeal to Christians to live their life in view of or in light of God's mercy. It is only God's mercy that changes us, and then through us, changes the world that we live in by blessing those around us. And so we need to ask the question, well, if we meant to live in view in light of God's mercy, where do we see that mercy? Where do we get to see it? 
What does Paul mean when he refers to God's mercy? Well, in verse 1 of chapter 12, we've just seen, it has the word, therefore. It has the word, therefore. Now, I want to let you in on a little trick of Bible interpretation. It's not really a trick. It's just, it's just real, plain English grammar. But much of the skill of interpreting the Bible is simply based on the principles of grammar that you learned in school. It's comprehension. In other words, what is the relationship of one word to another? So when you see a therefore in Scripture, you instinctively know that in order to understand what comes after the therefore, you need to know what comes before the therefore. Words depend on context for their meaning. So to understand what Paul is talking about when he urges us to live in view of God's mercies, we need to know what he's been saying in the previous 11 chapters of Romans. That's what he's talking about. This therefore falls after the first 11 chapters of Romans. Paul has been expounding on the mercies of God for 11 chapters. And now he says, I appeal to you in view of God's mercy. Now, live your lives as living sacrifices. So, turn to chapter 1 of Romans and we're going to start reading from verse 1. That's a joke, guys. <laughs> we would be here for a long time. But, I will say, It would be to your benefit if you read it. Go and read the first 11 chapters of Romans. Because it's Paul's longest letter. Romans is Paul's longest letter. And he's laying out the gospel for the believers in Rome. That's what he's doing. It is the most comprehensive presentation of the gospel in all of the New Testament. Possibly in all of the Bible. Romans is an essential book, essential letter to understanding your scriptures and understanding your salvation. In fact, some biblical scholars would say that it is imperative for believers' maturity in their faith to read and study Romans in order to better understand their salvation. And John Calvin, the great reformer, wrote that Romans is the doorway to the treasure of all of Scripture. Basically, understand if you, if you want to know what the Bible's about, read Romans. Read Romans. And so I would encourage you to read it, preferably in one go. It'll take you around one hour. Take you around one hour. You can do that. Okay? Maybe that should be a New Year's resolution. Once a month, set aside an hour and just read Romans. You will not be disappointed. Read it in one go. And so Paul is urging us to live in view of the mercies of God presented to us in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So here is a summary of that good news from the book of Romans. All of humanity without exception, regardless of culture, age, status, or belief, is under the wrath of God because we have suppressed the truth that God has given us. How have we suppressed the truth? Well, Gentiles, and that simply means all people who are non-Jewish, so the nations. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a catchphrase, a category that just includes everyone who's not Jewish. The Gentiles rejected God's revelation of himself in creation. God has revealed himself in what he has made. Paul says his eternal power and his divine nature is evident for everybody to see so that no one has an excuse. But what have we done? We've taken that knowledge, that truth, and we've suppressed it. We've stood on top of it and we deny it. So we're without excuse. It's clear. Someone created this world. Someone divine and someone very powerful. Then the Jews rejected God's revelation to them in the law, the Old Testament scriptures. So they're without excuse too because they didn't obey God's revelation to them in the scriptures. And so all humanity has listened to the voice of Satan and sinned against God and therefore falls under condemnation and the judgment of God. Patrick Schreiner, a biblical scholar, summarizes Paul's miserable depiction of humanity in Romans like this. He says, Jews and Gentiles are both condemned by the weight of their sin. God will judge the entire world since there is no one righteous, not one, All are under sin. The Old Testament affirms there is no one who seeks God, no one who does good. The influence of the serpent, that's Satan, has been effective far and wide. 
This is evidenced in the evil that has taken hold of humanity. Blood, cursing, war, and lying follow in their train. Every human is guilty before the judge, who is God himself. By works, no one will be justified before God. The law gives knowledge of sin and highlights the transgression of mankind. So even when we get revelation from God, his good grace to us, his good gift to us, knowledge of himself, we reject it and suppress the truth. And so humanity is left helpless and before a just and holy God. Without excuse and unable to pay for their own sin and rebellion against God. But then, Romans 3 verse 21 shatters the darkness of humanity's destitute standing before God with a declaration that brings the hope of our salvation. Listen to what Romans 3, 21 and 22 says. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Paul's just made a case. Humans have no righteousness of their own. But it's something you need if you're going to stand before God. And in that helpless estate, these words of hope come in. There's that word again, but. When you see that in scripture, it's about to break into our darkness with light. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Which means it's, you don't have to obey. You don't have to do anything. You can't work for your own righteousness. It's righteousness of God. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So the whole Old Testament scriptures declared, spoke about this righteousness of God. And what is this righteousness of God? Well, verse 22 says, It is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. It's a gift. It's a gift. God responds to our rebellion against him by by providing salvation to us, by transferring the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, to our account through faith in his life, death, and resurrection on our behalf so that we can now stand before God justified, cleansed, forgiven, redeemed, and righteous. Amen. Now, that's good enough on its own, but that's not where it stops. That's not where God's mercy stops. Not only do we receive a right standing before God, but we are also adopted into a new family, the church. We get brothers and sisters in the faith. And we're given a new hope that infuses us with joy, even in our trials and suffering, as we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies and the new creation. That is our hope. Now, in case you're still not convinced about God's mercy to us in Christ, because if we're honest, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes I have a nagging doubt and thought that I deserve better, that God owes me something, right? He's, he's, he's being a little bit schnup on his mercy. He's got a little bit in his back pocket that he's not handing out, and it would be nice if he just gave me a little bit more because I deserve it, quite frankly, Lord. I've done a lot for you. I mean, look at me. I'm, I'm a good guy. Well, let Romans 5, 6 to 10 drive the final nail into the coffin of your boasting or your thinking that you deserve God's mercy. Romans 5, 6 to 10. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled. While we were enemies, God's reconciliation came. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. 
God's view of you outside of faith in Christ. Now remember, God is the one who determines reality. His view is always clear, perfect, just, and good. We have a distorted view of ourselves, not God. God's view of you outside of faith in Christ. Now if you saw it there in that passage. Weak, ungodly, sinner, enemy. Weak, ungodly, sinner, enemy. While we were still his enemies, rejecting him, worshipping false gods, trying to earn our own salvation, walking according to our own wisdom and understanding, living life on our own terms for our own glory and our own pleasure. That's when Jesus offered himself up for us. So that his enemies, so that his enemies could be reconciled to God and become his children and co-heirs of the kingdom of God. That is mercy. What mercy? What compassion, what kindness, what goodness and grace that God has lavished on us through his son and only at the cross. Only there, only there, love and mercy flow to me. There is no better view from which to live our lives than in view of God's mercies. And so in view of this mercy, there's only one reasonable response. There's only one reasonable response, which Paul calls us to in the second part of verse 1. Look with me there in your Bibles. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is point number two, a reasonable response. The only logical, acceptable, and reasonable response to someone who has been brought from death to life by the mercy of God is to give ourselves wholeheartedly to him in worship. That's it. There is no category of a believer who does not want to do that. We all fall short in how we're doing that. But the desire of every true believer, every person who is living in view of the mercies of God to them in Jesus Christ will have this desire. It's the only reasonable response to God's mercy. And we will only do this if we're living in view of his mercy. Do you see the order? In view of God's mercy, present your bodies. Not present your bodies to gain God's mercy. It's important. It's really important. Get that order right. We only do so if we're living in view of his mercy. In other words, if we're keeping the gospel as the primary lens through which we view our lives, if we're doing that, we will naturally move in the direction of offering up our bodies as living sacrifices, as our spiritual worship. So what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? So basically it means to offer yourself to God, to offer yourself to God, to be used for his purposes, to live for his glory, and to align yourself with his will and his ways. This is the biblical concept of worship. Did you see it there in the verse? This is your spiritual worship. Some other um, translations will say, this is your reasonable service. This is the biblical concept of worship, to offer up yourself to God in response to his grace and mercy. When I say the word worship, most of us will think of singing songs in church. When you hear the word worship, generally what we think of is, ah, singing songs in church. Paul's understanding of worship is rooted in the idea of of sacrifice, not singing, sacrifice. The heart of the biblical concept of worship is not singing, it's sacrifice. Now, do we worship in song? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we worship God in song, it's, it's praise. But it's essential for us to grasp that worship is an all of life thing. It's an all of life thing. Listen again to Paul's words. Offer up your Sundays, no. Offer up your devotional times? No. Offer up your prayers at meal times? 
No. What? Offer up your bodies. Offer up your bodies. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but you can't escape your body. You may have tried, it doesn't work. Like, that's it. It's, it's who you are. It's who you are. It is false thinking to think I am my soul and not my body. You are your body as much as you are your soul. God has knitted the two together. He knits you together in your mother's womb. It's, it's, it's something in our culture right now that is, our culture is getting very confused. You are your body. You don't get another one. God gave it to you. He didn't make mistakes. You can't escape it. Regardless of what you do, you cannot escape your body because it's who you are. I know, right? I mean, this is, this is, what, I, this is what I get. Okay? I wake up every morning, see the same body. Regardless of whether I want another one. Gareth Brady does not exist apart from this frame that God has given me to exist in. Here's the big takeaway. You cannot compartmentalize your worship to God. You cannot compartmentalize your worship to God. Worship is not a part of your life, it is your life. Wherever your body is, wherever you are physically present, that is where you worship God as a response to His mercy. And just in case, just, just to help us understand this, you're physically present all of the time, everywhere. You're always physically present somewhere, doing something. This is why in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Paul says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Worship is an all-of-life thing. This would include eating, sleeping, playing, working, talking, listening, parenting, driving. You get the idea. Whatever you do, all of life is sacred and must be lived for the glory of God in response to His mercy. That's the only reasonable response for a believer. And next week, we'll look at what life lived in view of God's mercy looks like in the rest of Romans 12. Paul will give us some really practical examples of what that looks like. But let me end by encouraging you. It is God's mercy to you in Christ that changes you. Not the new year. Not a new habit. Not a new job. Not a new relationship. It's God's mercy that changes you. It's God's mercy that empowers you and enables you to live a life that is full joyful and meaningful it is god's mercy that gives you hope so you no longer need to search for hope and second chances and things that will fade and will disappoint you it's god's mercy that brings meaning to your day-to-day -day life so don't try escape the daily grind the daily, weekly, and monthly patterns and rhythms of your life, in other words, where your body is, is precisely where God wants to use you to display His glory. There is meaning and purpose in the mundane when you live life in view of God's mercy, even in the difficult parts of your life. I'm a parent of a two-year-old. Some of you can think back further enough to know what that's like. Some of you are in that situation right now. Life changes. The days all look the same. They blur into one another. You have the same rhythms, the same conversations with your kid. You know, trying to train him and discipline him in the ways of the Lord. Sometimes it can, it's, it's tiring. It's tiring. You wonder if, if you're making any progress. It's just day to day. Same thing again, same thing again, same thing again. Jamie is now in the Y stage. That's, that's fun. That's fun. Are oh, you still in the Y stage? <laughs> but you guys know what I mean. It would be a tragedy if Robin and I was to wish that away. No, God wants to enter into that with us in view of his mercy and fill those moments where our bodies are with the grace 
that he empowers us to live in those moments for his glory. It would be an absolute tragedy. It's a tragedy if you want to try and escape your life. My prayer really this morning is, is really, I've, I've been thinking about, I'm guessing a number of people in this room who are really hoping this year will turn out differently for you. Circumstantially. But chances are it may not. And you're going to need something deeper and stronger and more certain than a different set of circumstances to get you through what may be the same year as last year. And it's only in view of God's mercies. Robin Sharma says this, you can't live the same year 75 times and call that a life. You can't live the same year 75 times and call that a life. With all due respect to Robin Sharma, that's rubbish. That's false. It's not gospel-centered thinking. I don't know who Robin Sharma is. He's probably not a believer. I completely disagree. If you do the same thing year in and year out for 75 years in view of God's mercy and for His glory, well, that's the best life you could possibly aim for. It's the best life you could possibly aim for. And the beautiful part of living life in view of God's mercy is that His mercy never comes to an end. It never fades or diminishes, and as Lamentations tells us, it is new every morning, which means you get a fresh dose of mercy every day, every day. Maybe instead of having a list of New Year's resolutions that generally, let's be honest, have a 31st of January expiry date on them, maybe even sooner, how about we have a new life resolution? Let's have a new life resolution to live our lives in view of God's mercy one day at a time and trust Him for the results. We're going to have the Lord's Supper now. I'm going to pray for us in a moment. And I'm going to call the worship team up here just as, as we think about what's in front of us. Why do we do this? Why has God instituted this rhythm in the life of a church? Well, we do it to remember. Remember what? God's mercy to us. God's mercy to us in the broken body and spilled blood of Jesus. This is an actual example to literally live in view of God's mercy right now by physically remembering him. The Lord's Supper is an ordinance for God's people instituted by Jesus himself to help us keep his mercy in our view. That's why we do it. He gave his life to redeem us, cleanse us from our sin, reconcile us to the Father. And in view of his great mercy, we take part in this meal and offer ourselves up as living sacrifices for his glory. Now, this meal is to be enjoyed by believers in right standing before God and before one another. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, which means you've, you've never put your faith and your trust in the Lord for your salvation, if you, if, if you don't believe in, this, in Jesus, you don't believe in God, there's no point in taking part in something that you don't believe. Don't be a hypocrite. Rather, sit, observe, and consider God's grace to you in your rebellion against him. Hear his offer of salvation. Turn from your sin and trust in Christ alone to save you. And you can do that in your seat. And then you can share in this meal. Because this is a meal that declares what we believe. If you're a believer, and you're living in unrepentant sin, or you have broken relationships in the body of Christ, refrain from eating the meal, first repent of your sin, first restore the relationship, and then you are free to come and eat this meal in remembrance of Jesus and his body, the church. Parents, with children, young children who are sitting here, you know your kids. If they have made a credible profession of faith, what's a credible profession of faith? You can see some fruit in their lives that they do in fact believe the gospel then they are free to come and take part of this meal. 
but I will leave that up to your discernment and discretion to walk your children through this. Let's pray. And then the team is going to play uh, one of the songs we just sang. Uh, you guys are welcome to take and eat in your own time. You're welcome to sing the song with them or to just listen to the words. After we've taken, we will stand and sing together um, in response to what the Lord has done for us, His mercy. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy to us. We do not deserve it. We can never earn it. And yet, Lord, while we were weak, ungodly sinners and enemies of yours, you sent your Son to die for us at the right time. The just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous, the holy for sinners. Lord, and in that moment, as we put our faith in you for our salvation, as we turn from our sins, from our rebellion against you, and turn to you to accept the only way of salvation, in that moment, we got your righteousness, which means we stand here as your people, perfectly just, sinless, righteous, welcomed into the kingdom of God, welcomed into the family of God. Lord, I pray that as we take, as we eat the bread and as we drink the cup, Lord, we would remember this great sacrifice, Lord, and that you would use this moment, that you would use it, that you would sustain us in your grace to live our lives in view of your mercy and to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our only reasonable act of worship. We pray this in your name. Amen.